Okay. Thank you, everyone, for coming. My name is Josh Williams. Uh, I actually work uh, in the Link group at Microsoft, which is within the Office organization. Uh, I'm guessing a few of you at some point in your career have probably used Microsoft Office uh, for good or bad experiences. Uh, my role, obviously, is to try to make those experiences better. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you something about a little bit different. Uh, the type of games that I've been working on the past few years really are games about uh, getting work done more effectively. So these aren't the type of games like Farmville, which, as near as I can tell, you don't accomplish much of anything. This is, a, this is the type of game we're trying to create, which actually will allow people to get work done that's beneficial to the company or beneficial to the organization in general. Uh, but first, let me tell you a bit about myself. Gary did a great introduction, uh, but I've been at Microsoft about 17 years mostly as a test engineer. Uh, and in my test role, I have the opportunity to do a lot of things, uh, work on data analysis to try to determine processes that better improve testing process, or work on uh, processes around how we manage code churn, things like that. So I have a variety of different types of things I've had the opportunity to work on. But the game stuff is, in particular, some of the most fun. But first, before we get into that, I want to go back in time a little bit. It turns out games have been around for a very long time. Even as far back as the construction of the pyramids, uh, groups of employees, let's call them, uh, were actually competing against each other for a greater share of mead at the end of the day. So the idea that work can be built into a competition type event has been around for a very long time. And it didn't just end there. I mean, even uh, hunter-gatherers or even as far forward as the Greeks would have competitions that would demonstrate skills that were the same skills they had to, show, to have to survive. So this, there's always been this longer-term relationship between work and play. And uh, there's been some work even into the, the, that shows that even into the uh, 19th century on farms that... Uh, and children growing up would, do, would be learned to manage the farm via games, uh, and that particularly in craftsman uh, environments, like uh, mill workers or uh, steel workers, prior steel workers, I guess you call them blacksmiths, uh, would actually also mentor their junior apprentices with the form of games. So this is the type of work that's been around for a very long time. But a lot of that changed when the Industrial Revolution came along. As factories started to come online, uh, the factory would mandate the pace of work. And so the leisurely way in which games would be allowed to interplay with work slowly was pushed out. And as the 40-hour work week became a standard, at least in the United States, uh, and as the time clock became more and more important and there was this drive for efficiency, more and more of leisure activities and games that existed to help produce learning or produce experience were slowly pushed out of the workplace. But, you know, we believe change is happening. And we've been doing games like this for a very long time, but I want to talk a little bit about why I think this change is happening and why I think that the environment in the future is even more ripe for this type of game. First of all, the type of work we do is changing. Everything now requires knowledge work somewhere in the process. Even the, even the gadgets we buy really are a physical manifestation of a whole lot of knowledge work, a whole lot of ideas, a whole lot of innovations that allow us to use those products. And more and more of the economy is moving this way. This is what we call a knowledge economy, and it's really becoming the standard. So that, coupled with a changing workforce, uh, and really kind of has a combining effect. Now, the workforce is changing in a number of ways, one of which is we have employees working later in life, we also have a younger generation coming into the workforce, which has had is grown up digital from the get-go. Uh, statistics show that there are kindergartners, a higher percentage of kindergartners entering, uh, you know, elementary school, who are more capable. Sorry, a higher percentage can play a video game than are able to tie their own shoes or swim. So the generation that's coming into the workforce has had this games and Nintendos and these types of digital experiences with them their entire lives. This uh, diversity of workforce presents a whole bunch of challenges in how people are managed and in how uh, companies are organizing themselves and how they reward people for different activities. Okay, but it's not just the work or the workplace, but all, sorry, the workforce, but the workplace. With a continually more mobile workforce, where work is happening can be anywhere. It can be in a cafe, it can be at home. It can be in a, work, a traditional work environment. 
the workplace, where it can happen, can be globalized as well. It doesn't have to be a specific building like it has been for a long time. Again, this is another shift that companies are taking a more social responsible, uh, socially responsible tact and allowing technologies such as online meetings to become more prevalent uh, just as a way to help reduce the carbon footprint of employees' work. And then finally, the type of product that gets produced is different. How many of you have worked on a product that has been not influenced by social media at this point? Right? Getting feedback from your customers, applying that in the product development cycle is changing the type of products we produce. It's changing all the products that are being produced. So all these shifts are coming together at the same time to produce an environment where games can work at work. In fact, we would assert they can work again like they did uh, prior to the, the Industrial Revolution. Let me talk for a minute about some of the games we've done. This is a screenshot of a game we did called the Language Quality Game. The Language Quality Game set up an environment where we had screenshots for every dialogue in Windows 7. And we would ask, on a voluntary basis, employees across Microsoft to log into the game and pick the languages they spoke, and then they would be presented with a screen that they could review to ensure that the localization made sense. And they would highlight errors with a pen, and if they didn't like it or had a problem, they could drag it into the bad bucket on the right, or they could drag it into the good bucket on the left if they thought it was fine. Now, it's a very simple game, very simple game mechanic, just allowing people to provide feedback. Well, for a game that we launched, uh, and you see, oh, I guess I should mention in the bottom right, it's kind of hard to read from a distance, but we had leaderboards. So within a given language, there was, there was leaderboards for who had produced the most screen reviews. And we launched this internally to a, on a voluntary basis. No prizes, no rewards. Internally within Microsoft, Microsoft has about 100,000 employees around the world. And we were able to get 500,000 screens reviewed in four weeks. So something that we didn't think would go that big went very large very quickly. We were able to find several thousand localization errors we got fixed before the game was done. And we were able to ship 36 languages in Windows 7 all the same day. It was a remarkable impact for what in terms of investment was very small. Because as I said, the game mechanics were simple. Throwing a dialogue up was simple. The tools that harvested the dialogues were already in place for other business processes. And we gained a lot from this. More recently, we did another game uh, called Communicate Hope. Now, prior to being called Link, the Microsoft Link product was actually called Microsoft Office Communicator, and uh, basically does instant messaging and so forth. When we were working on the Link product that exists today, uh, we, did a, we did a beta program inside uh, Microsoft as well for people to help us test and try out the product. And the motivator wasn't a leaderboard or a prize. What they had the opportunity to do was to earn points for a charity that they were passionate about. Now you can see the sub-tag here was a benefit for disaster relief. We worked with five charities, um, all of which could be represented in the game as a team. And we had some marketing money that had been donated by a couple of marketing organizations. And what happened was, is you picked a team as a player and performed actions that we would like you to perform. Try and do an online meeting, do an instant message, create new contacts, whatever the action was. You were awarded points, which would then go to your team. And at the end of the game time, which was a couple of months, the team with the highest points got the highest share of the money given to that charity, and so forth and so on among the five different charities that were participating. So this was a different type of game, because instead of motivating the employees solely based on being at the top of the leaderboard or showing their own prowess, they were actually motivated by supporting a charity that they were passionate about of the, of the five that were available. But even outside of Communicator, my friend Daniel Burley has done a series of games uh, for human resources efforts. When Microsoft does job fairs in different places, he's actually taken on tasks to develop kind of a series of games to help em engage people who come to the job fairs. They're given tasks to go online and watch a video or to go to a different booth on the other side of the building and get some clue. And they follow these series of activities around as a way to both introduce them to the Microsoft culture, to learn about the way employees are, what their passions are, to help them decide if coming to Microsoft is the right choice, but also as a way to help them um, share the information that's useful to Microsoft about whether they're a candidate for someone we want to pursue in the future. So it's a, the, the way to use games can be varied and can be quite broad. 
And finally, I want to mention this other series of games. A friend of mine, Adam Shostak, in the Windows security team, uh, what he has done is developed a series of games to try to help people produce more secure products. And uh, the first one he produced, you see up here on the right, is called Elevation of Privilege. And it's a card game where you actually take turns and your turn is you have to come up with a potential weakness on a per category basis. And I can't fully explain it here, but it's based on the game of spades. And you play this card game as a way to generate ideas for how the application can be made more secure. Now, they've worked on a next generation of the game called Hackers Inc. And you see a little bit of quote uh, to that on, the on, on your left. And the Hackers Inc. game is another card game that is really all about if the hacker was trying to attack your infrastructure and they had a series of magic tools, what could they use, right? And through these games, uh, he is trying to provide a way for people to look at security in a different way, to learn a set of skills that are beneficial to their product in the long run. And these, both of these are available for free as downloads. All right, so the real question is, is why do games work? Are there places that games work best or worst in different environments? And we've actually found that there are some places where games really struggle, and I want to go over a few of those with you. Okay? Oh, sorry. I'm in the wrong place in my slides. I want to talk about why games do work. Uh, so Aaron Dignan recently wrote a book called Game Frame, and he goes through a lot of the history of why games are particularly effective. And he speaks a lot about how games are different from life in that games are, are structured and lives are unstructured. Random things happen in life all the time. But in games, things are a lot more predictable. Things are a lot easier to handle. And even what's unpredictable is in a framework we understand. And the game is geared and designed for me to have a pleasurable experience. And life doesn't always work that way. So there's a natural draw for us to go to games. And what this draw brings us to is the ability to get into a state of flow. And the flow concept is, of course, popularized by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi uh, in the early 90s but is this idea of a state where you're being challenged commensurate with the skills you have. And video games have always done this. As you get more experience in the video game, it gets a little bit more difficult, right? And that, the result is you get into this state of flow, which is the, a very high level of enjoyment and satisfaction on the part of the player, right? Too much challenge without a skill, now you've created an environment that's unpleasant. The player is anxious and they want to work on honing their skills. They have more skill than the game requires them to have. It's easy for them to get bored, and there's a risk. So there's this golden area where games really help us to get there. And that's one of the capabilities that games provide, is for people to get into this state of flow. All right, so where is the challenge? Where are we trying to solve? What problems are we trying to solve with games in the workplace? Well, the Gallup organization does a yearly poll called the Q12, and uh, these numbers are pretty consistent year over year, so this is not just a, a recent phenomenon. But the bulk of your employees are not actively engaged in doing their job, right? Now, 29% engaged means they do their job, they're just not necessarily doing their best. They're not putting in 100% like we might hope them to be. But there are at least 50% who are not doing their job at all. They're not engaged in their job. They may get the work done, but it's not their passion, right? So the question is, is what are some mechanisms we can use to help encourage them to find work entertaining? And that we, we use games as a way to do that. All right, now games, of course, are built up of a number of layers. Games are not as simple as, you know, you throw a tic-tac-toe board up there. Just like with games in the real world, there have to be mechanics. There have to be the different actions that take place in the game. And uh, that's the base layer that, employ that, that anyone, any player, is going to engage in is the mechanics of the game. But that's not the end. You want there to be a higher level. Like, what is the point of the game? Is it person versus person? Is it person versus environment? What type of play are you trying to establish? Right? And these, this same thinking goes into video games as goes into games for work. The highest level, of course, is the aesthetics, where you're talking about what is the goal the user wants to achieve? What is the feeling you want the user to achieve by accomplishing something? In the Communicate Hope game, the feeling we were shooting for was that they felt satisfaction, that they were supporting the charity that they were passionate about. So that's the highest kind of highest level of game design you're going to want to take into play. All right, let's talk about where games struggle really quick, like I mentioned before. This matrix really talks about, um, along the top axis, the type of skills required to do your job. Okay? And some of those are core skills that everybody has in your organization. 
some of those skills are unique. That's why I'm actually employed to be there, specifically my job. And then expanding work skills would be the educational, like uh, skills I can learn to grow and enhance my employment. All right? The, the rows, starting from the left, enroll behaviors are behaviors that I do as part of my job because I'm paid to be there. That's my actual job. Uh, organizational citizenship behaviors are a separate topic, which are tasks I might undertake to actually help improve the quality of the organization or improve the organization as it stands. All right? So that might be, for example, someone who's willing to refill the coffee pot on a regular basis. All right? uh, it's not something that's required of them by their job per se, but when someone does it, it's better for everybody. All right? Now, let's talk about where games don't work very well. When you map games to very specific work skills, right, one of the challenges you face is that you exclude a lot of other employees. A lot of us, and a lot of the economy is really based on specialization. And if your game requires a specialized skill set, you're going to exclude a lot of players, and that sets up an environment where you're not getting as many players as you could. Again, the type of games we're talking about here are, in a sense, a crowdsourcing effort with a framework of a game built around it. All right? Okay, another space where games don't work. Uh, if it's too closely tied to my job, all right, if we do, you know, a game which is do Josh's job, and we launch it across the, my organization, and at the end of four weeks, I'm not in first place, that creates a really awkward conversation with my manager, okay? Uh, so we try to avoid games that really closely map to people's jobs, to individual people's jobs. Now, games do work, of course, in the education space. Games have been long established in education, all the way from children's games, children's math or spelling, their learning. But games also work in that education space all the way through military simulators, through civilian simulators for learning how to fly, any type of place where serious games are applied. Really, a lot of those are based in the education space. But where we've found the most success has been in the organizational citizenship behaviors, where you can get as many people playing as possible. And that goes back to the language quality game. The real requirement to play the language quality game was to be a native speaker of one of the languages we were trying to have reviewed. So everyone was able to play as a result in the company that spoke a foreign language. Um, and that really opens up a great opportunity. It's a voluntary effort. It's not competing with their day job per se, because we're setting up an environment where they can play just for a few minutes and still provide value to the corporation at large. And that's where we find games actually do work the best. All right. Finally, I want to talk about the environment we have set up that we actually allow games to flourish. All right. We have an initiative we call 42 Projects. And 42 Projects really is an experiment in how we manage people differently. Right. We really focus on three different pillars in the, uh, in the, in the project. Uh, one of which is collaborative play, a lot of which I've talked about. But we really encourage teams to set up their own games, their own challenges, their own projects, and to try to interact in a different way. We also focus a lot on trust. I'm sure you can think back to situations where you've been in, uh, at a company where there's just a low level of trust between employees. It's very difficult to work in that place. It's very difficult to be innovative in a place like that as well. So creating a high trust environment ends up having a huge impact on how employees work together, how they're able to share ideas and make more innovative products as a result. So the 42 Projects initiative, initiative excuse me, has been around for about four years. We've written quite a bit about it. You can learn more about it at 42projects.org or follow the uh, Twitter feed 42 Projects, at 42 Projects. All right, benefits for games. Games actually do help build a trusting environment because now you're in, you're, you're in a sense creating an opportunity for people to play together, to talk together, to communicate, uh, about something other than the day-to-day -day grind of getting work done, right? Uh, it really improves the, improves the communication within a group, the engagement in people's jobs, the amount of work they're able to get done outside their job and at their core job because their level of satisfaction at work has actually gone up. And if you think about it, employees want out of their job the same thing that gamers want out of their games, right? They want it to be fair. It's no fun to play a game and die when you don't expect to die because the game had a mistake, right? Now, you're not going to die at work, obviously, and I'm not advocating that we kill our employees, but people want to be treated fairly. They want to have transparency and understand what's going on in the system, and they want feedback all the time. And all these things are core to making great games as well. 
So as we look forward to making games, whether it's for the work environment or for whatever environment you choose to, you know, there's a lot of opportunities out there for how we improve the engagement of people in different environments. And I believe games provide a really powerful tool to do that. Thank you very much. Sure, I can take questions. I was, uh, I was nervous we were gonna try to scrunch in some people. Um, okay, now, so um, do any of you guys have any questions for John? You can ask it in Spanish if you want and I'll translate just in case some people, sorry Josh, <laughs> just, uh, just in case uh, anyone feels nervous. Sorry, here. Yeah, uh, you talk about leaderboards and putting kind of a com a competitive reward for the employee. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't it be better to have some kind of uh, cooperative so no one gets excluded and no one wins over another employees so they have a better environment? In the yep, absolutely. In fact, the truth is it's, it's, a much richer, it's a much richer problem than just having all one type of game versus another type of game. There are a lot of people who are motivated by the competitive. They want to be at the top of the leaderboard. And that certainly is a, a mechanism you can use to drive different behaviors for that subset of employees. But there are employees who don't want to play that way. There are employees who just want to be able to complete a challenge, solve a problem on their own, and maybe beat their own personal score. Maybe it's something where they're competing against themselves, right? So when you're building your game design, I tried to reference this in the dynamics section, the type of game you put together, you really want to make sure you appeal to the broadest possible audience. What we've found is that when you have a variety of tasks you want done in a job, in a game, excuse me, different tasks you may want to accomplish, it's great to have some tasks that lead to a leaderboard and some tasks that lead to, I want to compete against my personal best and solve puzzles and other tasks that really talk about how do I beat the environment in this case, not just compete against my own history, right? So setting up those different mechanics and richness in a game really allows you to draw in the most possible players. Does that answer your question? All right, great, thank you very much. Any other questions? Okay, so. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to Josh.